I have the honor to introduce Dr. Time Buffel. His theme is Spatial Justice and the Right to an Age-Friendly Community. Dr. Time Buffel is a sociologist at the University of Manchester, where uh, she had the Manchester Urban Asian Research Group, an interdisciplinary group bringing together scholars interested in understanding the relationship between population, aging, and urbanization. Time has published extensively in the field of aging, with a particular focus on social and environmental issues associated with an aging population. Her research career uh, has been distinguished by her commitment to working with community association to study and address issues of equity and social justice, building on a foundation of innovative uh, participatory and co-production methodologies with older people. She has been particularly interested in studying issues uh, related to community and neighborhood life in all age, inequality and social exclusion, urban deprivation, and development of age-friendly environments. So uh, research, her research has received several awards for its impact on policies and practices to improve the lives of older people. Good afternoon or morning, uh, depending on which part of the world you're in. Uh, and thank you for joining us today. Um, thanks also to the conference organizers to give me this opportunity to talk about a topic that is very close to my heart. Um, it's a real honor. Um, the title of my talk is Spatial Justice and the Right to an Age-Friendly Community. And I would like to acknowledge uh, all members of the Manchester Urban Aging Research Group who have provided input and inspiration for different parts of this presentation. My talk is structured as follows. Uh, first, I'll present the background to creating age-friendly cities and communities. Then I will argue why we should be concerned with this topic, followed by a discussion of the key achievements and challenges for the age-friendly movement. And I will end with a manifesto to inspire progress for the movement, which builds on ideas around spatial justice and the right to an age-friendly community. First, some background. The idea of creating age-friendly communities developed from several policy initiatives launched by the World Health Organization during the 1990s and early 2000s. And these stress the importance of creating enabling and supportive environments to promote active aging. And the notion active here referred to encouraging the participation of older adults in all aspects of society, social, cultural, spiritual, economic and civic matters, so not just the ability to participate in the labour market or to be physically active. The Age Friendly City programme was introduced for the first time in 2005 during this very IAGG World Congress of Gerontology and Geriatrics in Rio de Janeiro. And in 2006, the WHO Global Age Friendly Cities project, led by Alex Kalachi and Louis Fluff, was launched, which involved a study of 33 cities across the world with the aim of identifying the key features of an age-friendly city from the perspective of older people, caregivers and local service providers. And this study identified eight domains that needed to be addressed to increase the age-friendliness of cities. These were presented in the WHO Global Age-Friendly Cities Guide in 2007, which used the age-friendly city flower to show that interventions are needed in the physical environment, around housing, transportation, outdoor spaces, as well as in the social environment, such as civic and social participation, and in the community and health services. And the guide defined an age-friendly city as an inclusive and accessible community environment 
that optimizes opportunities for health, participation, security for all people in order to enhance the quality of life as people age. To encourage implementation of the recommendations from the 2007 project, the World Health Organization launched the Global Network of for Age-Friendly Cities and Communities in 2010. And this had the aim of fostering the exchange of experience and mutual learning between cities and communities worldwide, and to support cities and communities to find innovative and evidence-based solutions in becoming more age-friendly. Since its launch in 2010, the network has had a rapid increase in membership, now covering nearly 1,400 cities and communities in 47 countries across the world, but with more limited coverage in the Global South in comparison to the Global North. Overall, there has been a rapid expansion of the network and age-friendly initiatives, although importantly, this has happened in the context of economic recession, a contraction of the welfare state, austerity policies and the widening of inequalities, both within and between countries, factors which have raised major issues for the development of age-friendly programmes. But the policy commitment to create more age-friendly, supportive environments has remained a central element of strategies and action plans for active and healthy ageing, as highlighted in a number of reports, including the World Report on Ageing and Health in 2015, and more recently, the UN Decade of Healthy Ageing, a global collaboration aligned with the Sustainable Development Goals, which aims to bring together governments civil society, academia, the media, the private sector, to improve the lives of older people, their families and the communities in which they live. And the decade addresses four areas of action, one of which is to create age-friendly environments across key cultural, economic, physical and social dimensions. The decade also highlights the importance of community-centered approaches in supporting healthy aging the importance of which has been further accentuated by the impact of neighbourhoods of the COVID-19 pandemic. A number of reasons may be given to improving our understanding of the environments in which older people live, and four reasons are of particular importance and are listed on this slide. Firstly, because of the increased importance of home and neighbourhoods in later life, with Research suggesting that around 80% of the time of people aged 70 and over is spent at home or in the immediate environment. And this is a key finding which suggests that work, which can improve the communities in which people live, can have a major impact on raising the quality of life. Certainly for older people, but for groups across the life course. Secondly, because the strong research and policy focus on ageing in place, or the idea of supporting people to stay at home in their own neighbourhoods for as long as they wish. And the emphasis here in social policy in the majority of countries in the Global North focuses on supporting people to live in their own homes, as opposed to moving into institutional settings. However, again, this requires the development of a range of policies which can make ageing in place a viable policy, especially for those living in areas characterised by social and material deprivation. Thirdly, because the neighbourhood can be an important source of social inclusion, through the opportunities for developing a sense of belonging, whilst also being a potential source of social exclusion, especially in deprived neighbourhoods characterised by high levels of poverty. And finally, because of the opportunities that age-friendly communities can bring in terms of guaranteeing human rights and social justice for older people, an aspect um, I shall develop in the final section of my presentation. In the past decade, attention to age-friendly cities and communities has increased within academic research not only in gerontology, but also in other fields such as public health, sociology, geography and urban studies. 
Since 2015, there have been several special journal issues dedicated to the topic, as well as a number of books and reviews. A review published in 2022 uh, by Torku and colleagues, for example, found an accelerating trend in the number of publications on age-friendly communities. Each year since 2014, and they documented a collection of articles focused around four key areas. Firstly, conceptual foundations of age-friendly communities. Secondly, implementation and development approaches. Thirdly, assessment methods. And fourthly, challenges and opportunities for facilitating age-friendly work. So having set out the background to the age-friendly movement, the next section of my talk will consider some of the key achievements illustrated with some examples of current uh, work around age-friendly communities. So taken together, academic and policy work on age-friendly communities has recorded a variety of achievements. Notably, greater recognition in urban and regional planning of the implications of population aging. And this is especially with regard to redesigning outdoor spaces and housing and transportation. An example of this can be found in Ottawa in Canada, which has modified its outdoor environments to enable older people to keep fit by adding modified fitness equipment, removing uh, tripod hazards from pavement curbs, adding benches, and generally promoting a range of interventions to help make environments more welcoming for older people to stay active. In Skerries, Ireland, older residents undertook a walkability study that subsequently informed the development of footpaths, um, pedestrian crossings, um, public seating and transport facilities. And the municipality of The Hague in the Netherlands works together in partnership with housing providers to build affordable lifetime houses, including specialist housing um, programs for lesbian, gay, um, bisexual, transgender and queer older people as well as for ethnic minority older people in the city. Interventions at the level of the physical environment have been an important feature of age-friendly work. However, there's also an increased recognition that developing age-friendly communities is as much about the social infrastructure of neighborhoods as it is about the physical infrastructure or the built environment. Social infrastructure building on the work of my colleague Sophie Yarker and that of American sociologist Eric Kleinenberg, refers to the shared spaces, the organizations and the facilities that allow us to develop and maintain social connections or form social networks and be part of a community. And this can be green spaces, cafes, libraries, barbershops, community and voluntary and faith-based organizations all of which have been found to play a critical role in supporting people to age well in place. In Melville, Australia, some cafe owners have dedicated staff and seating to welcome people living with dementia, but also their carers and families who can come together for a monthly catch up. And all staff at the cafe are trained in dementia awareness and provide an inclusive atmosphere responsive to the needs of both people diagnosed with dementia along with their carers. One of the key achievements of the age-friendly program in Brussels, in Belgium, for example, has been the opening of seven social meeting spaces called Espace S for seniors across the city. And these offer leisure activities, information, sports, training sessions for older adults that are delivered directly at the neighborhood level. And similar social meeting spaces have also been created in Dijon in France and Longcoche in Chile and are considered to be key resources for the community.
The age-friendly movement has also inspired campaigns to change the societal narratives around aging and to reduce ageism. And one popular way to achieve this goal has been to encourage the development of communication campaigns that use a more realistic and a more positive image or non-stereotypical image of older adults. In Guadalajara, Mexico, for example, there have been a number of campaigns to change people's perceptions of aging in order to reduce uh, the stereotypes, prejudice and discrimination on the basis of age. The World Health Organization also produced a global report on ageism in 2021. And this outlines what strategies are effective in preventing and countering ageism, but it also identifies gaps and proposes future lines of research to improve our understanding of ageism. Campaigns against ageism, along with its intersection with racism and sexism, should certainly be central to age-friendly work. And a framework for this will, de will be developed in the final section of my talk. Age-friendly initiatives have also spurred new models and community-based approaches to promote the central and the active involvement of diverse groups of older people in decision-making and in co-producing co age-friendly research policy and practice. And here I can give the example of work I have been involved in in Manchester, where we trained 18 older residents to become co-researchers in a study that was aimed at improving the age-friendliness of deprived urban neighborhoods. And the co-researchers were involved in all phases of the study, from co-designing uh, the research objectives to co-producing the research materials. And they also interviewed 68 older people who were experiencing social isolation in the neighborhood about their needs for an age-friendly environment. And together with local community organizations, the co-researchers developed actions and solutions for the problems that were identified in the study. And after the study, we found actually that many of those co-researchers became advocates for the age-friendly agenda. And one finding from the research, for example, that was acted upon was the local bus service, which was cut due to funding pressures a year prior to the research. And this was identified as a major problem for all the residents in almost all the interviews that were undertaken. And the co-researchers played a key role in campaigning for the restoration of the bus service which, after months of campaigning, was successful. Finally, the age-friendly movement has also expanded the boundaries of the field of ageing and bolstered support for interdisciplinary work, linking fields such as um, urban design, architecture, sociology, social policy, uh, community development, public health and others. It has also stimulated cross-sectorial working and the development of new partnerships stimulating social innovation. For example, in Akita in Japan, the Age-Friendly Living Lab, Akita All Ages, is a fascinating initiative that focuses on co-designing services and products that meet the need of the aging population through a collaboration between the local government, older people's organizations, and a number of private companies, such as Akita Cable TV, a local newspaper, and Akita Bank, all of which have supported the development and the advertisement of co-designed age-friendly services. While all these achievements and examples demonstrate the contributions of the age-friendly movement, there are also a number of key challenges that limit its impact, its reach, and its sustainability. And such challenges are rooted within the broader context and systems influencing age-friendly initiatives, as well as in aspects of the age-friendly framework itself. First, successful age-friendly programs are to a large extent dependent upon strong political support and leadership. They also require long-term commitment and sustained public resources However, when cities are experiencing changes in local leadership, political dynamics, and pressures on resources, 
We have seen that this may cause age-friendly work to fall, fall down the priority list with the risk of losing support, momentum, credibility and staff buy-in. Second, such challenges around political and financial support are felt especially acutely in times of economic austerity and the scaling back of public investments. While the initial interest in developing age-friendly cities came at a time of global economic growth and expansion in public sector programmes, this trend has been very much reversed by the 2008 financial crisis. And as a result, many of the cities in the global network have experienced reductions in the services of direct benefit to older people. Examples being the closure of senior centres, cuts to home-based care uh, and other ageing services, financial pressures on community and voluntary organisations, cuts to home modification programmes and so on. And such cuts disproportionately affect vulnerable and marginalised groups of older people and those living in deprived communities. And this last aspect has been further amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic and presents significant challenges to achieving the ambitions of the age-friendly model. So investing in and securing long-term resources for community-based services and organisations that support marginalised groups of older people in areas of the greatest need will remain a key task for an age-friendly post-COVID-19 recovery. And any long-term strategy to combat the pandemic has to be rooted in addressing the multiple forms of deprivation, whilst also strengthening the neighbourhood-based organisations working at a grassroots level. A third set of challenges is linked to the difficulties for tracking progress and showing impact across complex and dynamic systems in aspects of the interrelationship between the physical, social and service environments, all of which are highly context dependent and do not easily lend themselves to the standardization uh, of measurements. So a crucial task for the age-friendly movement is to establish what works and what is most effective in supporting older adults. Developing the research base and creating research capacity for evaluating age-friendly work will be crucial in the years ahead. A fourth important challenge will be to promote digital inclusion as an important feature of the age-friendly movement. A survey in my own region of Greater Manchester showed that 56% of people aged 75 and over had not used the internet in the past three months or had never used the internet. Such digital exclusion may be especially risky for older adults in preventing them from accessing resources or accessing sources of support and assistance. The digital divide is a key issue for our work and one which almost certainly has increased over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. A fifth challenge is about taking a more structured and strategic approach to the creation of opportunities for older adults' voices to be heard at different levels, from the global to the local. And this needs to come with an increased understanding and an analysis and addressing of the factors that influence a person's voice to be heard. The age-friendly movement has been influential in promoting the slogan nothing about us without us, but in reality there is in fact considerable scope to strengthening older people's voices and participation in decision making and in empowering marginalized groups of older adults to claim and exercise their rights. A final challenge is linked to the all-encompassing geographic scope of the age-friendly movement. And the idea that there is some sort of universal standard for an age-friendly city, or a unified model on how to achieve change based on a model of what an ideal city represents. 
Just to take two examples from the WHO Age-Friendly City Guide checklist, there are items on the checklist such as public areas have to be clean and pleasant, or there needs to be sufficient affordable housing that is safe and close to services. And these are, of course, very important aspirations, but they are likely to have little resonance with the actual challenges experienced on the ground by older people who live, um, for example, in informal settlements or amongst those who live in severe poverty deprived from basic services. Abodorin and colleagues examined the applicability of the age-friendly city approach in slum communities in Nairobi in Kenya. And they show that the pursuit of what they term age-friendly slums uh, will require substantial modifications to existing age-friendly domains and indicators to fit the locally defined priority challenges and context of older adults in slum settings. In addition to that, cultural notions of aging and intersectional social positions add further complexity to conceptualizing age-friendly initiatives particularly in the context of oppressive social structures, such as ageism, sexism, classism, ableism, and racism. The persistence and legacy of colonialism in particular contributes to challenges of age-friendly efforts in many areas of the global South, especially in lower income countries. So a key argument of this presentation is that the concept of spatial justice provides a useful framework for examining the progress of age friendly initiatives. And this framework is centered around three key principles, including firstly, co-production, or the use of participatory approaches involving those who are excluded from decision-making processes in defining priority domains and actions for age friendly change. Secondly, a focus on equity and fairness to ensure that the benefits derived from age-friendly policy do not just favour those who are already better off. Thirdly, an increased attention for diversity, which requires the recognition and respect of different groups. The concept of spatial justice links together thinking around social justice on the one hand and space on the other. And it builds on the work of geographers such as David Harvey and Edward Soja. It reflects an intentional and a focused emphasis on the spatial aspects of justice or injustice. And the argument here is that a spatial justice framework brings new opportunities for theory building, as well as the empirical analysis of the ways in which resources can be distributed in a fairer and more equitable way, and how opportunities to use those resources can be realized. Such aspirations have particular resonance for the challenges of building age-friendly cities, given the inequalities which have developed over the past decade, the impact of private developers in controlling urban space, along with the effects of gentrification and rising housing costs in many urban areas. So building on this framework of spatial justice, we can start to develop a manifesto for the age-friendly movement that is aimed at raising its aspirations, focused on three areas, increasing opportunities for co-production, tackling inequality and increasing diversity, and strengthening global and multi-sectorial collaboration whilst integrating research with policy. The first point is about the role of age-friendly work in fighting for the rights of older adults to ensure the full and complete usage of the spaces in our communities. And a spatial justice lens here brings a focus on questions of redistribution, the democratic experience of cities and citizen empowerment. So cities and communities for people, not for profit. And this reflects Lefebvre's idea about the right to the city. And this is not just about the right to access and uses of the spaces in your communities, but also the right to participate centrally in decision-making in all aspects that affect our lives. 
such as issues around public transport, accessibility of buildings and services, technology, green and blue spaces, etc. Portland, Oregon, for example, has created public forums where political candidates collaboratively develop aging policies in partnership with older adults who can voice their concerns and give advice directly to decision makers. In Manchester, in the UK, older people contribute to the city's age friendliness by a membership of the Age Friendly Older People's Board. And through their engagement, older adults help develop an overall strategy for the city and bring new priorities to the fore. Similar methods have also been used in the province of Quebec, in Canada, where the Age Friendly program is based upon a community building approach involving older adults as key partners in a collaborative partnership responsible for the implementation of age-friendly action plans, comprising interventions to improve the social and the physical environment. Such initiatives suggest a voice for different residents of all ages in the redevelopment of cities. And they also point at the role for age-friendly work to investigate new ways in which older adults can be involved in the regeneration and in the planning of their environments. The second point is about the importance of a focus on inequalities and their consequences for age friendly initiatives. And the key argument here is that unless age friendly programs pay explicit attention to questions of inequality and social justice, they run the very risk of amplifying those inequalities. For example, several researchers have found that age-friendly initiatives still have the strongest profile amongst white and middle-class communities, and that minoritized and marginalized groups are often remain excluded. So understanding how age-friendly work engages with older people facing different forms of social exclusion, particularly amongst minority communities, is therefore especially important. One which will require new techniques and methodologies for accessing vulnerable populations. Participatory mechanisms would help us to better understand the different social and cultural interpretations of what age-friendly might mean, whilst also recognizing the forms of inequality experienced by particular groups, for example, in relation to health, income and housing. They also help us to improve our understanding of the impact of racism, ageism, ableism and sexism within our communities. The impact of racism and discrimination on older people's experience of ageing in place is a key issue that needs much more attention in work aimed at improving the age friendliness of communities. Another form of inequality we need to pay attention to in age friendly work are health inequalities. An aspect which again has been highlighted as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The question here raised by Stephen Goland remains a pertinent one. Do age-friendly initiatives reach out to people with all types of health conditions or are they mainly focused on those who are already active in their communities? Another question is whether age-friendly programmes have the structural capacity to support people considered frail or those with dementia and other conditions. Often this is a group who are excluded in age-friendly discussions, despite their social and demographic importance within communities. It is important to acknowledge the variety of groups for whom age-friendly issues are relevant and the need to build environments that support and reflect the increased diversity of ageing populations. One issue that needs further attention is the extent to which age-friendly communities can help overcome the numerous challenges that older people with disabilities face in moving around and in gaining, gaining access to the facilities offered by their environments. From the lack of access to public transport systems, to the absence of visual clues or guides to enable vision impaired people to move around and barriers in using footpaths, toilets and buildings like shops and restaurants. 
The key challenge here will be to link the age-friendly movement with those campaigning for the rights of people with disabilities. The separation of these movements, weakening both in the challenge to support people of all age groups to improve the quality of life in the environments in which they live. Another issue which needs attention are the organisations involved in age-friendly work. So far, the movement has drawn mainly upon organisations that are already involved in campaigns affecting older people. But these may have limited connections to other groups, such as those working with ethnic minority groups, refugees, women's groups, and faith-based organisations. And each of those organisations will be affected by ageing-related issues in different ways. So their involvement could make a substantial contribution to creating a more inclusive and a more representative age-friendly movement. Community and spatial inequalities are another form of injustice that age-friendly work needs to attend to. There is extensive evidence about the impact of neighbourhood level inequalities on the physical and the mental health in later life. And research by Marmot and colleagues in the UK, for example, highlighted the particular problems experienced in left behind and uh, ignored or deprived communities, such as the loss of vital community assets, reduced resources or funding, public services that have been cut, all of which have damaged health and have widened inequalities. The loss of assets and services further intensify the multiple deprivations already faced by many residents living in such areas, including persistent poverty, poor health and poor quality housing. And once again, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and further exacerbated these inequalities and studies from different countries highlighted the disproportionate burden of both infections and deaths in neighbourhoods with higher rates of poverty. Figures from the Office for Na National Statistics in the UK in the first wave of the pandemic in 2020, for example, showed that people living in the most deprived areas were dying at twice the rate in the first wave of COVID-19 compared to those living in more affluent areas. Minority groups were amongst those most affected, especially those from the South Asian community and the Black and Afro-Caribbean communities. And based on our research exploring experiences of older people during lockdown in Greater Manchester, one of the arguments we developed is that older people living in deprived neighbourhoods have experienced a double lockdown suffering the effects of enforced social isolation as a result of COVID-19 instructions to self-isolate, whilst at the same time living in places which were already affected mostly by the loss of services and social infrastructure. Such findings underline the importance of understanding the structural capacity of neighbourhoods to support age-friendly work and ultimately the limitations for doing so. In our study examining the impact of age-friendly programmes in Manchester, for example, we found that there were significant differences between the different areas studied. In some neighbourhoods, there was a lack of public spaces or buildings from which to promote age-friendly work or from which to recruit volunteers and host events. And we found that this has had a detrimental effect on the extent to which age-friendly programmes could engage with the community and the extent to which they could deliver the work. So it is in the areas with the greatest need for age-friendly initiatives that much higher levels of support and capacity building will be needed in order to develop this work in the first place. A final point I'd like to make with an eye on expanding the ambitions for the age-friendly movement is the need to strengthen the global network of age-friendly cities and communities, including the support for it, as well as the building of new partnerships and collaborations with a range of initiatives. 
For example, coalitions with other movements around creating smart, healthy, green, livable and sustainable cities are important to ensure that age-friendly work is both connected with and embedded in debates about uh, responding to climate change, reducing pollution, increasing energy efficiency, digital technology developments and so on. The challenge here will be to strategically align age-friendly efforts with these related yet distinct agendas whilst not losing the focus on ageing, longevity and older adults. And finally, there's also a need for creating more research capacity in this area and to build the evidence base. As mentioned before, research on age-friendly cities and communities has grown exponentially over the past decade, but there is great potential to expand the research collaborations and the connections across different regions, countries and cities. And one way forward here is to develop a working group to coordinate a range of research and knowledge interventions and initiatives. But there is also great potential to achieve a better integration between research and policy and to advance the knowledge to action component, especially across the various dis disciplines working in areas of relevance to building age-friendly environments. I hope together we can continue to inspire and encourage the next generation of age-friendly scholars to contribute to creating fairer, more inclusive age-friendly cities that are built around principles of equity, community and spatial justice and are based on a citizenship and a rights-based narrative on ageing. I'd like to end with a couple of questions for age-friendly research policy and practice to address including to what extent does the development of age-friendly policies and practice support spatial justice? What can we learn from age-friendly initiatives that have used co-production methods to promote the central and genuine involvement of older people in decision-making processes surrounding their environment? And what are the emerging and new directions or approaches and methods for developing and researching age-friendly cities and communities that will help reimagine and broaden the scope of age-friendly work. Thank you very much for listening. Here are just a few selected publications. You can find more on our website of the Manchester Urban Aging Research Group. A warm thank you also to all the co-researchers in Manchester, all the members of um, the group, as well as the Leverhulme Trust for their generous support.